Louisiana can really fly in the base paths. We're underway with strike one from Berzon to Davis in the 1-0 game. The winner advances straight to championship Sunday, and whoever falls in this one goes into the final game of the day, and it is an elimination one at that. We say it every single year. The longer you can stay in the winner's bracket, the better chance you have to advance to the Super Regionals. And that really goes for both of these teams. Absolutely. I mean, that's the goal. When you get to postseason, stay in the winner's bracket. Much easier path. Not only because you don't have to play again later today, you don't have to beat a team twice in a row. And when you talk about Louisiana and LSU so evenly matched as it is, that's a tall order. Got her on the one-two. That could be a huge key for LSU, keeping Maya Davis off of the base paths. Defensively, LSU is one of the best in the country, fielding 975 on the year. Stuart Briggs and Rudy around the outfield, left to right. Coffee Gutierrez in the corners, Pleasants and Petty up the middle. Pleasants one of four. SEC all defensive team members in this starting nine. Allie Newland behind the plate, making up the battery with the freshman Burzon. You just can't underemphasize, Francesca, what it does for a team to keep Maya Davis off of the bases to start off the game. I, mean, I think you said it. That is the key to the game for LSU. If you're going to try to come away with this win, you have to keep Davis off the bat, the bat, base path. Excuse me. Yesterday, she stole two stolen bases, making it 48 stolen bases on the season for Davis. She is just two off of the national lead at 50. Berzon has allowed six runs in her last two starts, but the important thing, all three of them in their tournament loss to Ole Miss were unearned. The other three earned. Of course, that one swing and a miss. Pulled the string, two and two on Kotzelnik. That's a very pretty pitch right there from Berzon. That's a pitch that I think that she's going to have to throw quite often, especially because of the power that the Cajuns had. Take a look at this. This is 10 miles per hour different with the same tumbling movement of her drop ball. I can't emphasize how tough it is for a batter when you see that same down movement with a different velocity. You're going to swing and miss majority of the time. Payoff coming from Berzon. Got out in front, out towards first, and there's Gutierrez. The SEC all defensive team member squeezes it for out number two. This could be a real X factor for the Tigers. We know that defensively, it's advantage LSU. On the base paths, in terms of stolen bases, it is very much advantage Louisiana, and that could come into play, especially later in the game. Yeah, you nailed it. All SEC defensive team, four members, LSU 976 fielding percentage, just compared to Louisiana's of 968. Sophie Piscos looks at a pitch that just misses. Piscos had a great start to her NCAA tournament yesterday. Two for three with a couple of doubles. A run driven in and a run scored in Louisiana's 5 nothing shutout of Omaha. Foul ball. One hop to Coffey, who might not be a member of the SEC all-defensive team, but she is so vastly improved there after taking over last year. Head coach Beth Tarina told us just puts in the work day in and day out. It was her idea to go over to third base. And she has really grabbed that spot. And then some. I love how her teammate said that no one takes more ground balls than Danica Coffey at third base. She's disappointed with some of the errors that she made last year at the second base position. And she wanted to be a big supporter, defensive supporter for her team. So she put that work in. And 
That's something we hear quite often, Alex. The ones, those stars, those different makers, they put that work in day in, day out because they know they want to be the best. Originally made the move trying to replace Amanda Doyle over at the hot corner. This is a postseason environment from the get-go. Here in Baton Rouge, they know this game could hinge on one pitch here, one pitch there. And we will have our second straight full count. You're going to see a lot of Burzon bouncing that ball in the dirt. Allie Newland, the catcher, she started in left field yesterday. You see her kind of switch off depending on who the pitcher is. Definitely, though, with two strikes as a catcher with a drop ball pitcher, you got to make sure that you are keeping that ball in front of you. Ripped into right center field. Sophie Piscos cut off by Briggs, and that holds Piscos to a single. Piscos works an incredible at bat, getting Burzon to elevate this pitch and shoots it into that right center field gap. This looked like a double right off of the bat, but Briggs taking that incredible deep angle to cut it off and to get it in quickly just to limit Piscos to a single. This is that tremendous chess match that we're going to be talking about all game long and probably all weekend long as well. Right there, Briggs saves a base, maybe on the other side. Louisiana takes a base with, you know, their ability to steal. So it, it's going to kind of go back and forth right there because with a lot of different center fielders, I think Piscos is standing on second base. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's not just the speed that Briggs possesses, but it's the fact that she understands the type of angle that she has to try to cut that ball off. You cannot try to meet that ball, meaning as an outfielder, if you see it, you cannot go to that same spot. You have to go to where you're anticipating it will get to. Kayla Falterman has come in to run for Piscos here with two outs in the first inning. And Lauren Allred, the freshman, takes a strike on the outside corner. Might be a first-year player, but boy, is she dangerous. Allred, an all-Sun Belt first-teamer as a freshman. Leads this team with 45 runs driven in. She didn't even play until the 15th game of the year. Nobody is home at second base, and because of that, Falterman advances. And Newland was fooled by the start and stop from Falterman, and she's into scoring position in the first. You see Newland understanding the speed that Louisiana has. She thought that she heard that the runner was going, and she was not. She was just taking, Falterman was just taking an aggressive jump. That just shows you how, I'm not going to say nervous, but maybe a little nervous knowing the speed that you have to be quick back there. Bounds just foul over to Gutierrez. Now one and two. Burson one pitch away from getting out of this first inning unscathed. And Louisiana probably a base hit away from taking the lead. All red flies it deep left field. Stewart has room and squeezes it for out number three. Louisiana threatens but does not score here in the first. LSU coming up in the bottom half. To repeat that type of production as Danica Coffey leads off for the number 10 seed LSU against Sam Landry. The best way to describe the one-two punch of Danica Coffey and Sierra Briggs for LSU is dynamic. Coffey extremely quick. Briggs can hit for a little bit of power. She can also slap it around the ballpark. Coffee third in the SEC with 70 hits this year. Just at about 400 for the season, but had a little mini slump at the end of the year that dropped her down, and now she's only at 393. Well, you know what they say about postseason and stats, Alex? It goes, out, it goes out the window, Throw right? Out. It's kind of like that new season starts and doesn't matter how many hits you're getting, just as long as you're getting it when it matters the most. Beth Torina said she thinks this is an All-American caliber year from Danica Coffey. Yeah, 
I agree with that. You mentioned just how many different tools that she has, not someone or someone that doesn't just have that speed that can put that bunt down, but she can power slap. She can find those gaps. We saw that yesterday. Had a bunt, soft slap, and then a hard double. Well, we know LSU fans are not going to make it easy for Landry and the rest of her Rage and Cajuns teammates. They want this place to be a fortress, somewhere that there is no question Louisiana is familiar with, but they don't want that to be an advantage. And when you talk about the team history, this is the 10th time Louisiana has been sent to the Baton Rouge Regional. And they thought they could host this year. They were very, very close. An excellent resume, 11th in the RPI this year. 3-2 is bounded foul down the left side. And I knew going into the Sun Belt Conference Tournament, Louisiana thought, hey, we need to win this because that we feel like that would solidify us hosting. Uh, but unfortunately, they didn't get that hosting seed. And instead, they got sent to their rival at LSU. We asked Coach Glasgow if they were upset. and. They were disappointed, but they just have to come now and compete. On the eighth pitch of the at-bat, Danica Coffey singles through the left side. Here is how Louisiana sets up defensively. You can see the outfield, Davis and Heath center and right. Kotzelnik getting the nod in left, even though she's been replaced by Falterman at this point. Hayden and all right around the corners. Langoliers, Vasquez up the middle for Valdez, making up the battery with Sam Landry. Although get used to it from Jerry Glasgow, the terrific head coach for Louisiana. He is going to make changes all over the place. So we are going to keep you as informed as we possibly can. They're going to be pinch runners, pinch hitters, defensive replacements. He's like a lineup mathematician he's almost. A, he's yeah. a mad scientist. Mad scientist. In so many yeah. different ways. But, uh, his players told him he's got a method to his madness. Yes, there is. And that includes about 23 or 24 pitching machines yes. at the team facility right now. Not only that, but he brought some about an hour east here from Lafayette to Baton Rouge. Jerry Glasgow has all of the commendations that you could really hope for. He certainly has the resume, even though this is his first time being a head coach at the college level. He has continued the Louisiana tradition. Poked foul down the left field line. But he's worked for three different SEC teams, Georgia, Texas A&M, under the legendary Joe Evans, Auburn as well part of three Women's College World Series clubs as a coach. I love how his player said that he likes to put pressure on us in a very caring way, which makes us always want to step up for him. 0-2, oh, it'll get into the net, and we'll see another pitch coming up. And Francesca, he's someone that you have a lot of respect for. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I got he coached against me when I was at University of Florida. He was at the University of Georgia, and I always knew going up against him he was going to try to find every way to get me out and had some experience with him in the pro league as well. And I, I just always wanted to be a sponge around him, listening to how he tries to get the best out of his players and his strategy is next level. Looked at the 0-2 down and away to Briggs. And really when you look at someone like Jerry Glasgow, he was at the forefront on some of the hitting mechanics that we see everywhere right now. 10 years ago, like what's being taught now was not being taught 10 years ago, but he was doing it, which is why you always saw so much power from his teams. One two is popped up on the infield, calling the catch Lang Lears, and one away. Exactly what was he doing hitting wise? You know, uh, when you look 10, 15 years ago, I'm not that old, I swear. Um, but it was all about linear hitting, not using your lower half so much, trying to be more hands first. They would always call it a softball swing. He was one of the first to say, there's no such thing as a baseball swing or a softball swing. It is a swing, and let's move our body the right way systematically so that we can develop as much power and try to put ourselves in a good hitting position constantly. And it's completely changed the game. Completely changed the game. And I think a lot of data and analytics has really brought it around to everybody else in the school to say, okay, this is actually how we need our bodies to move in order to set us up for success. 
You see it a lot actually with the LSU Tigers. They've adopted that philosophy and it's something that they, they preach a lot. You, you say kind of twitchy movements, trying to get those hips kick starting first, then your core comes, that strength with it. That almost like a rubber band effect that by the time you fire, you're just slapping that ball. Pleasance looks at the third straight outside the zone. And to your point, we were talking with LSU hitting coach Howard Dobson. I mean, there are really two hitting gurus on these teams. And another thing that makes this such a close matchup, there's not separating much at all in terms of philosophy or talent with LSU and Louisiana. Howard Dobson has been there every step of the way with Beth Torino. 12 years as well as with assistant coach Lindsay Leftwich, who was also with her at FIU before this. And not only that, Houston before that. I know, I think they said they've been together for like 16, 18 years. So that's something that you hear a lot from LSU, the players, the staff, it's family here. It's all about creating a strong culture. I love one of their one of their many taglines and saying FTC for the culture. Everything is for this program and for the players. Beth Torino co collected her 600th career win on March 11th against South Carolina. Also has coached the most games of any female coach in LSU history. This is her 710th. Yeah, it's her story. Just correcting you there. <laughs> That's fair. Payoff right back to Landry. She will take the sure out over it first. And the speedy coffee moves into scoring position. Bit surprised she didn't give him more of a look at second base there. I think she was, Landry was so locked in on trying to get someone like Taylor Pleasance off that the moment that she got that ball, she was just thinking, get the out at one. That's something as a player you always have to tell yourself, okay, if I get the ball, where am I going with it? As a pitcher, you got a lot going on in your mind. And so now it is up to Georgia Clark. 42 career home runs for her fourth all time at LSU in her final season and this, of course, her final NCAA tournament as well. Has already received a Masters. She got an MBA earlier this month. Her GPA, not terrible, 4.12. Mm, she can get it up higher. Not enough to just get an <laughs> MBA. One thing that's going to make facing someone like Georgia Clark a little bit different is that she's the only right-handed hitter in this lineup today. The rest of the Tigers lineup, you have all lefties. Coffee the go-ahead run on second base for Clark and the 1-1. One -one. Sydney Brazon stranded a runner at second in the top of the first. And Landry trying to do the exact same to LSU in the bottom half. So interesting, Alex. We've seen Sam Landry go with more of her rise ball, kind of going up and down, staying low in the zone, being more vertical with that rise ball when her very best pitch is a changeup. We've only seen it thrown once so far this inning. You wonder if she'll break it out right here on two and two. She does not. Instead, it's a bounding ball over to Langoliers, and she throws out Clark. So Coffee stranded at second base after the leadoff single and threw one here at Tiger Park. Over the 90-degree mark, and we see a lot of fans out there from the fans, like literal fans in the stands who are trying to keep cool because not all of them are undercover. In fact, most of them are not here at Tiger Park. Plenty of Louisiana fans have made the trip over. It's just about an hour west to Lafayette down I-10. And Jerry Glasgow was telling us beyond the left field wall they wanted to have the red berm. They wanted 
that to not be purple, not be gold, but instead be red. And, and so far we are seeing that. See a bit red out there. I feel like you'd want it to be a little bit more red though. Well, it, it's tough it's because, tough. you know, being here in Baton Rouge, the advanced ticket sales done already sold out there was a limited number of walk-ups so this is this is not an easy place to get into this weekend yeah it was like some taylor swift situation too fans were trying to buy it and the site was crashing down and that is down and away leadoff walk to the sunbelt player of the year carly heath who had a solo shot yesterday and now sydney brazan in a bit of trouble to begin in the top of the second and Brazon was really respecting the type of power that Heath has. They wanted Heath to chase that drop ball away, but Heath was strong into her game plan and not chasing. You never want to give off that leadoff walk, but can someone like Carly Heath, why not use your defense behind you? Someone like Brazon constantly throwing that drop ball, they are just a double play away from clearing out the bases. Look out for Heath, though. I mean, along with her 15 home runs and 44 RBIs, she's stolen 22 bases in 24 attempts. And Jerry Glasgow is telling us, you know, it was a goal to steal 20 bases, and then in his fantastic sarcasm said, well, yeah, it only took you two years to do it. I mean, he really had to coax it out of her. He was the one saying, like, you have speed, but you're playing like you're a slow player. Like, let's get this out of you. We can make you so much more dynamic and lethal by adding this next element. And he was absolutely correct. Not just those big power numbers, 15 home runs, but you said it, Alex, 22 stolen bases on the season. That's unheard of. One, two, too far upstairs. And even though Louisiana might technically be a mid-major playing in the Sun Belt, they get power five types of talent. One of those, certainly Carly Heath on first base, who came over from South Carolina. Jordan Campbell from Texas A&M, as well as Megan Shorman from Kentucky. So three SEC transfers on this roster this year. Just a new element to this game. It's not just being able to go out and recruit the youth, but being able to check into that portal and find a new home for a player that is looking for something else, maybe something a little bit better. Not everything's always a happy marriage. You gotta go out there and date a bit. Missed on the 2-2, two -two. throw down! And it's in and out of the glove of Taylor Pleasance. Absolutely would have nailed Carly Heath for just the third time this year. We have said that you have to be ready back there because the speed that the Cajuns have, and it looks like this ball beats Heath to second base, but the ball pops out of Pleasant's glove on the tag right there on the chest. And as she's sliding back, it comes out of her glove. Gutierrez chases right into the net. It's a tough break right there if you are Newland. Yeah, it really is. And that is something you would not expect to see from Taylor Pleasant's who is one of the best defensive shortstops, not only in the SEC, we know that, but in the entire country. And the payoff chopper over to third, foul as Coffee picks it up. Well, we talk so much of how evenly matched these teams are, and it really came down to the difference of the speed that Louisiana has. So as a catcher, you have to be ready to go. You have to know that you have to have that good throw every single time. And you take a look at the caught stealing for LSU, Bergeon and Newland, nine for 43. That's about 20%. High pop out to right center field. Briggs is over to make the play. Throw down to third on the runner advancing, not in time, and he takes third. Mentioning with the Cajuns 20% or excuse me for LSU 20% of the time being able to catch a rendered steal So that's how big that play would have been if they were able to hold on to that tag Because now you see Louisiana still being able to play station to station Langlers hits it deep enough so that Heath can still tag up and now she's just 60 feet away From getting the first run of this game. Yeah now a fly ball probably gives Louisiana the lead in all likelihood. And that's just what that speed can do, just another element.
take a look. Heath understanding that she has to go the moment that ball hits leather, gets there easily. A couple of arms right now in the pen. There's Raylan Chafin who started yesterday's game through a complete game in a, a shortened five inning run rule. And on the right side is Emma Strude as well. You can see Ali Koponen lurking in there, not yet throwing, but uh, you know she's going to make an appearance at some point. Oh, I, I think for sure at some point we are going to see Kilponen. If you go back to that SEC tournament, that game one, it was Burzon who started. Kil Kilponen came in, cl uh, closed it out. Didn't get the win, but it's definitely that one-two punch we mentioned at the Open. Maddie Hayden now as LSU brings the infield in just a couple of more steps, and Burzon starts her out with the strike. I mean, Burzon, and we, we just see, saw Coach Beth Torino come out and talk to the freshman, Burzon, probably just trying to reset her, but also telling her at the game yesterday for Louisiana, it was the bottom part of that lineup that did not get a hit. So Burzon needs to know who she's going up against. Still execute your pitches, but know that you have a slight wiggle room. Six through nine, a combined 0 for 7 yesterday with a couple of strikeouts. Hayden was 0 for 2 with a K herself. 1-1 one, one is over to second. They'll go home. Tag by Newland is on the money. Petty to Newland for out number two as Heath is cut down. Jerry Glasgow is probably going to issue a review here and use one of his challenges. That is exactly what he is going to do. First challenge of the Baton Rouge Regional. And it is all centralized in the NCAA tournament at a facility outside of Pittsburgh. Let's take another look. This is why those pressure situations has put the ball in play. And I think the question is, Newland tags on the backside. So does Heath get her hand as she dives in in the back side of the plate. Let's see if we can get it from this view. I don't know, I think she, it looks like she gets the tag before she hits home plate on that first glance. And remember, the call is out on the field. Has to be indisputable video evidence to overturn this. And even if it is bang, bang, because it is, it's really close. Is there enough? I feel like I would want to see it again, but quickly in just that one replay we had, it does look like Newland got the tag on that low back before the hand hit the plate. Also, one thing to think about is obstruction right here. Is Newland blocking the plate before she gets the ball? Look at her knee, where her knee is before she actually receives the ball in her I glove. I think her knee is like in line with the chalk. Look at her left knee. This is the question right here. I feel like she has that path around I think I'm straight I think I'm with you yeah yeah, yeah. Ooh, you agree with me I do something. agree with okay. you on this one yeah <laughs> absolutely so they'll probably do the reverse of what I say <laughs> so if you look at the tag or you look at obstruction both of them it could be very difficult to overturn this I call. agree with you you know maybe there's different camera angles that we're not seeing though that might have that better view but and out is the call so the call is upheld at home plate. Robbie Guest was all over it. And after video review, it is the exact same. Carly Heath cut down trying to score, and they're two away. So I've been asking myself this question. It's so great that we have video review, so we know that you're getting it correct every single time. But it does bring momentum to that other side who gets the call correct. Kind of a game changer in that moment. Victoria Valdez, cutting a miss. And you can just hear LSU chanting the crowd was when they confirmed that the call was out. It must feel like a little bit of a blow if you're on the other side of it. Valdez had a two-run home run in Louisiana's earlier win against LSU. Remember, they split their season series back-to-back -back days. 
A 5-4 win for the Ragin' Cajuns over the Tigers right here at Tiger Park on February 25th and February 26th. LSU returned the favor up there. Slow chopper over towards short. Pleasance has it and makes the strong throw over to first to get LSU out of the top of the second. The big play. Once again, get to see their Tigers in Oklahoma City. And they can absolutely get there with the type of talent that this squad has. With a healthy Taylor Pleasance, this team is completely different than what we saw in the middle towards the end of the year. Yeah, and, and I'm going to say she's healthy. Like, we've seen her take some big swings. She already had a double in the tournament this weekend. She feels like she is at 100%. From my eye test, it looks like she's at 100%. We got to see their BP earlier, and she was slamming them. Allie Newland leads off the All-SEC first team selection. What a year she had, especially once conference play rolled along. She hit 413 against SEC competition. It's not often you're so much better against that type of team as that one is flown out towards left and taken in by Falterman for out number one. Now, a lot of times you see teams tear it up in non-conference, and then once you get to SEC play, well, it changes a little bit. You don't have that type of success, and Newland is the opposite. Yeah, I mean, when you're in the SEC, you're going up against some of the toughest competition every single weekend, to your point. Sometimes the averages tend to dip down, especially because these teams know each other so well. So much video out there, so much analytics that you can really set yourself up to be successful. But Newland, like you mentioned, being able to get on that first team all SEC for her first time. And here is Mackenzie Rudity. Might find herself there by the end of her LSU career. If she takes the type of jump that she did from freshman to sophomore year, there is no telling what the ceiling is. First year is the full-time right fielder has started every game there. Her average up more than 60 points from last year to 304. And she drives one. Deep center field, chases Davis back, and she gives it a look into the bleachers. Mackenzie Rudini with a solo shot puts LSU on top of Louisiana. We talk so much about the power that the Ragin' Cajuns has. LSU says, not so fast. We got that power as well. Rudity getting that six home run. I love big home runs and games like this. Rudity just getting this pitch. This is right down the middle. You have to be disciplined in your approach when you're going up against a team that knows you so well. When to swing at those good pitches, and that was that cookie type of a pitch that you know as a player you can take deep. And she knew it right off of the bat. Bunted butt foul. LSU has gotten the bats going in a big way. When you talk about power, came into the regional with one home run in their last seven games, and they've already put three out of the park so far. I think the difference right now in this game is, we talked about it already, Alex, is Landry's not throwing that off speed as often as we normally see her. She's trying to be more vertical with that drop in that rise. And on that home run pitch, that rise ball did not get up in the zone. It just stayed flat. Why do you think she hasn't gone to the changeup more so far? I think it just comes down to scouting and pitch calling and Coach Jerry, Jerry Glasgow knowing that they trained for Landry to sit off speed, to sit on that changeup. So when you kind of pull a different pitch as the number one and number two, it can get into a hitter's head, but you have to execute. Off the fists over to Landry for out number two. But on the flip side of that, Francesca, you make yourself so much less dynamic as a pitcher if you take your best pitch out of the equation completely. I agree, I agree with you. but Don't you have to trust your stuff? You have point. to trust your stuff, but right there she wasn't able to execute that spin, and that's why it just stayed down the middle. I mean, I like the move. You need, you need to be able, especially going up, up, up against a potent lineup like LSU, you have to be dynamic. You want to showcase different pitches to keep them on their toes. But again, have to execute it. Raylene Gutierrez now. Nobody on two away, but LSU with a 1-0 lead on Mackenzie Rudity's home run. 
sixth of this season for this sophomore. And Gutierrez swinging a hot bat. Was two for two with a couple of runs scored and a stolen base in yesterday's five-inning run rule win over Prairie View A&M. it over towards second and Vasquez to all red for out number three but LSU takes the lead teams that meet so often and three times Louisiana has come to Baton Rouge and has pulled off the upset to continue on the only question though who is a Gerard rooting for she was neutral in her shirt too, yes, she going was. with that light gray and both teams do have like light gray as an accent in their colors. Not today, but they have it. I would imagine it's like trying to pick your favorite kid, though. I mean, you, you get your start at Louisiana at the time, Southwestern Louisiana, before they changed their name. And then, of course, at LSU, before Beth Tarina took over and has taken this team to even greater heights with those four women's college World Series appearances. Pitch hitter Laney Crater flies out to left, and that is how the top of the third gets underway. In my freshman year at University of Florida, LSU was such a huge softball powerhouse, and you always knew you had to try to bring your very best, not because of the players, but because of someone like Yvette Gerald coaching those players. You, you had to bring it because she was going to beat you pretty much every single time. One out from Maya Davis. She fouls it back. Also, a vet part of the broadcast team here for most of the softball games with Lynn Rollins. Very entertaining. She's a great analyst as well as a great coach. Davis a strikeout her first time up against Berzon, and she'll tap it over to second. Quick underhand flip by Petty in time, and that is exactly what you need to do against the speed of Davis. And that was probably the number one point when you looked at the scouting report on how are we going to try to beat Louisiana. We have to keep Davis off the base path. And you can see Petty quickly shoveling it over, knowing what that speed has or knowing what Davis's speed has. She makes that so close. I know. I really want to give Petty, too, though, a shout out for the play at home. That was a hard rounder that she could have easily fumbled on, but she fielded it cleanly with a great throw. I felt bad not giving her love on that. It's a long game, so you, you got your chance. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Don't sweat. I mean, kind of hard not to in this yeah, weather. That's but. for sure. <laughs> we do have some cloud cover right now here at uh, Tiger Park, but yeah, the temperature's around 90. It's steamy down there, but nothing that both of these programs aren't used to. It's not like Omaha coming in where the temperature was 62 degrees yesterday back at their home ballpark. Yeah. I mean, and it was 90 on the field. May in the southeast, you know what you're expecting here. Yes, you do. You got to be ready to sweat. But this is the type of environment you want to see for the postseason, and that's what we have gotten here in Baton Rouge this weekend. Look at this pitch right here from Berzon and the frame job by Newland. That looked like it was coming to hit Kotzelnik and then trails right back over the plate with Newland being able to force that first strike. Excellent frame job. 1-2 is bounded over to Petty again, and she's up to the challenge for the second straight time. A stress-free 1-2-3 inning against Louisiana for Sydney Berzon, her first of the game. Still 1-0 Tigers. Newland gets the nod behind the plate. Stewart, the grad student from Marietta, Georgia. 9-1-2 and two coming up for the Tigers. Sam Landry's only blemish in the circle was the solo home run for Marudity in the second inning. 
Otherwise, she's been great. There's the changeup. Yeah, she just missed that pitch. I'm not quite sure where exactly it missed. Maybe a little bit on the outside, but that's a pitch, that location. She wants to get called. You can even see her reaction right there saying, I don't know where it missed. Interestingly, you can see the reaction right there from Stewart of that strike call. You can see the reaction right there from Landry thinking that should not have been a called strike. But as a batter, as a pitcher, you have to establish what that zone is going to be. And if it's going to be called a strike up, well, you're going to have to fight for it. Two balls and two strikes. See, Landry has really had to work. Five three ball counts so far against LSU, the first trip through the order. And we'll have a payoff coming up to the nine hitter, Stewart. Laced out towards left field. Falterman on the run hauls it in. One away in the third. Don't miss a minute of the action from the end today. Every site is slated to play three games. I mean, if you are a softball fan, there is just nothing better than regional Saturday. Yeah, re I mean, regionals in general is so much fun because it's just a plethora of softball. I mean, there's eight games going on right now, including ours with LSU leading Louisiana. So hard, how do you choose? You have to have like the quad screen up going. I think you have to have a whole wall just for this purpose. You have to make like a little cave in your basement or something just for this weekend. I mean, I know I like get babysitters so my kids cannot bother me while I watch all the, all the softball. I have like two monitors going, my phone, iPad. And some surprising results so far. Again, still early on. Everyone started when we did, so noon Eastern time, but Virginia Tech with an early lead over Georgia 2-1. Alabama's come back on Middle Tennessee after falling behind. It's going to make its way into the bullpen. Maybe not too much of a shock, but uh, the number one seed, 12 overall, Northwestern trailing Kentucky 6-2 into the second, that game on the ESPN app. I thought that was going to be a spicy one for sure. Just, you know, SEC, Kentucky, they have that winning championship mindset. And if Stephanie Schoonover is healthy, that team is very different than the one that finished out the season. Yeah, and I, and I feel like I read something where she is going into postseason 100% healthy. Maybe doesn't have that much many innings under her belt right now. She's going to have to work some things out, but still, she's healthy. She'll throw it. I got to talk to Rachel Lawson a few weeks ago, and, and this is right when Schoonover came back in their series against Mississippi State, and she was saying, that's on me. I'm going to take that responsibility of making sure that Stephanie is as ready as possible and devise that plan to bring her back, because she had a forearm injury that kept her out for about a month. 2-2 Two -two lifted into right field and down for a base hit. Coffee and Briggs are just so multifaceted in their offense. You see well, her weight back on that off speed. Exactly. This is the off speed. Look at her hands. Look how she recognizes it with her hips, but keeps her hands back. So you see that little twitch with her hips, sees it, keeps the hands back, and able to get that single. That is just great hand-eye coordination and timing at the same time. Coffee now two for two already. Her fourth hit of the regional. Four for four with three runs scored. Not bad for your leadoff hitter. Runner on the move, throw down to second, not nearly in time. And Coffee is in there with her 11th stolen base in 13 attempts this year. LSU has that same type of a speed and it comes from someone like Coffee. She gets an incredible jump and that is just textbook stealing right there from Coffee. And she's into scoring position for her roommate, Sierra Briggs. 
popped up to short her first time up, and you would definitely expect the sacrifice here, or at least a bunt for a base hit. Instead, swinging away, back over Landry, and it'll skirt into center field. Coffee scores, two nothing Tigers. Love this one-two combo with Coffee and Briggs. Briggs being able to slap this right into the ground and take a look at where shortstop Langlears was at. She thought that she needed to switch over to third base to cover that five, six hole area, allowing that ball to continue to bounce up the middle. So a little miscommunication on the infield for Louisiana, but still a perfectly placed slap ball for Briggs. Way high and tight to Taylor Pleasance. You knew once that ball got over Landry's glove, that was the only chance Louisiana had. And once that happened, Coffey was going to score easy. I mean, I was a little surprised not to see Langlers a little bit closer to it just because of the range that she has. But because she took that step to her right first, that's why it was an easy single. Pleasance bounced right back to Landry in her first at bat. First time that she had been retired in the regional. Yesterday, three for three with a double, and she drove in three. Now up to a team high, 51 runs driven in. The winner moves directly to the regional final. And then they only have to get one more win to get to the Super Regionals. It's a massive advantage if you are able to take the 1-0 game. Whoever loses in this one is going to play the final game of the day, an elimination game in the double elimination bracket. And then they'll have to win twice against whoever comes out of this one tomorrow. And that's the hardest part about getting in the loser's bracket, having to beat that winning team twice. 3-1 is ripped up the middle for a base hit. Big turn by Briggs. She's going to go to third, and the throw gets by Hayden. Briggs going to stay there. Big turn by Pleasance. She'll get back to second. No throw. Second and third. One away. LSU still rolling here in the third inning. I mean, when you look at this Tiger offense, you're looking at Coffey, Briggs, and Pleasance, and Pleasance does her job of being able to shoot this into the gap using that leverage of that height that Pleasance possesses. And you can see Briggs is off running the entire time. And I can actually see Cook Betcherina wanted to send her. You see her point to home, but Briggs quickly catches the ball and sees that it is close to her, so she stays on third base. That's a heads-up call right there from Briggs. Here's Georgia Clark, the only righty in the lineup to face the southpaw, Chloe Riazzetto. What a spot for the freshman to come in with the 1-0 game potentially on the line here against the LSU Tigers. Heavily pressure situation for anybody to be inserted in this moment, but a freshman at that, you got runners in scoring position. You have one of the fastest runners at third base for LSU. You have to be pinpointing your location. Riazzetto has not appeared in a game since back on May 4th through just a third of an inning in a win over Louisiana Monroe. I like how she's coming in and just attacking the zone, being able to quickly get two strikes up against that home run power with Clark. LSU, they've been pretty good so far in this regional. Five for 13 with runners in scoring position. They know when to get that big hit. Swing and a tip back into the glove of Valdez. And an enormous strikeout there for the freshman, Riazzetto. Now you cannot ask for your freshman to deliver any better. She gets two strikes that are low and outside and then comes up with this rise ball. You can see Clark swings right underneath it. 
That's a big pitch. She'll have to deal with the all-SEC first teamer, Allie Newland still though. Starts her off just a little bit upstairs. Newland to fly out to left her first time up. But she bashed one off of the scoreboard against Prairie View in the third inning yesterday for a two-run homer. Briggs on third, Pleasance on second for LSU. with the foul attempt on the bunt. Newland behind in the count, one and two. A situation though that Newland has really excelled at all season long, 400 runners in scoring position. Can she deliver here? Yes, she can, fair down the third baseline. Pleasance coming around third. The throw home. She got around the tag of Valdez. Two more runs for LSU. Hopefully Newland is okay diving back into second base, but what a clutch hit making it 4-0 Tigers. Being able to get that hit off two strikes with that, Alex. Talk so much about having to make two strike adjustments. You have a lefty versus lefty. So you can see Newland standing up, feeling like she's okay. Maybe just has to shake it off. Give herself some time to gather herself. See her running out there. See Taylor Pleasance feeling good. Take a look at this hit right here. This is right down the line. I love these lefties, how they are able to let the ball get so deep and slap it. The throw, unable to hold on to the ball. Valdez bobbles it right here. And then you're going to see more run score for LSU. Or excuse me, right here, this is another look at Pleasance being able to get her hand behind home plate. Yeah, held on to the ball, but just was able to get the tag around, or the slide around, that is. Excellent job by Pleasance to get around the tag. And here is Rudity, who has a solo home run her last time up back in the second inning. A 4-0 LSU lead. They have started to open it up here in the third. Rudity rips it to center field. But Davis squeezes it for the final out here in the third. But it was absolutely an eventful one for the Tigers. Three more runs in. LSU leading 4-0. We'll talk with Louisiana head coach Jerry Glasgow. When we Jerry Glasgow. Jerry, you, you had a few different options uh, to start in the circle. You went with Sam Landry. What was the decision-making process between you and Justin? Uh, I think he just felt like that was the best matchup. He, he thought he would have a matchup there that would work for him and he went with it. Hey coach, you have one hit so far in this game. What are the adjustments you're asking your hitters to make right now? Yeah, we've got to get the ball up above the knees. I got to, you think it's the knees going to end up low, but it looks like it's at the knees. So we've got to be patient and wait on something up belt high. And then we've got to get the ball, we've got to thread the ball, get inside it and hit it up the middle. We're hitting the drop ball, pull side. You've got to go up the middle with a drop ball. And coach, appreciate the time, thanks. Uh huh. And Louisiana right now in danger of falling into the loser's bracket, and they would play in the final game of the day, which is slated for 6 Eastern time. But right now, they have some work to do offensively, trailing LSU, the host, 4 nothing, going to the top of the fourth. But for the Raging Cajuns, heart of the order coming up. Piscos, Allred, and Heath, 3, 4, and 5. As Sydney Brazon toes the rubber for her fourth inning. And first pitch swinging. And I don't think Jerry's going to like that very much. Petty squeezes it for out number one. No, certainly not, especially when he just said that he needs to see more patience out of his hitters, trying to force Burzon to get that ball up. Actually, right when he was done talking to us, he looked over at Piscos and said, get the ball up. Let's see the ball up. But in order to do that, you have to see more than one, two pitches. Force her to get uncomfortable out there. Five in a row set down now by Burzon, and she is settling into the game. 
Lauren Allred swinging at the first pitch as well. Allred a fly out to left. Her first time to the plate against Bruzon. Just one hit so far for the Ragin' Cajuns against the freshman that Beth Torina just calls different than anybody else she's ever coached. Ripped right at Gutierrez for out number two. And think about the type of arms that she has had here at LSU. I mean, that makes it even more impressive, the fact that Berzon is that player that she singles out like that. And she said that Berzon can be anyone she wants to be. It is like queuing up a video game when it comes to calling pitches because she can throw any pitch and beat you with any pitch that she has. The future is extremely bright for someone like Berzon. And Coach Beth Torina is known as one of the best college pitching coaches out there. And you said it. She has a legacy. She's coached a lot of All-American pitchers here at LSU. Hoping Burzon will continue to follow in that lead. And sometimes with a great pitcher, you got to get to them early. They had a runner on second back in the first inning, but Louisiana couldn't get her in with that fly ball to left field for all red. And since then, really not much doing at all offensively for the Ragin' Cajuns. See the home crowd wanting that to be called a strike. I just love right now Berzon being so efficient with her pitches right now. You have your team that has a big inning of scoring, and then you come in and quickly get to two outs. It's hot out there. You, you don't want to stay out there any longer than you need to be. And that's the other X factor that we talk about not falling into the loser's bracket. Yeah, it's going to be at 6 o'clock, but you're still playing in the heat, and you're playing two games today, and then hopefully two games tomorrow if you're able to win the regional. Carly eats guys it to right, and Rudity takes it for out. Number three, an eight-pitch fourth inning for Sydney Burzon. We'll talk with their pitching and head coach, Beth Torina, next. Fourth, we're joined by the Tigers head coach, Beth Torina. And, and Beth, I look back at that at bat from Allie Newland. What a huge hot shot down the left field line to give you guys a 4 nothing lead. Fair to say she's an unsung hero on this team. I found myself thinking while she was up to bat that there was no one else I'd rather have in that moment. Runners on second and third, and I found myself saying, like, this is the one. This is the one we want up right here. She's been so great for us all year, and just anything for this team, anything. So it's awesome to see her have that moment. I love that, Coach. Your freshman, Sydney Burzon, getting her first start in regional action. What do you like from her so far? I like everything about her. This kid is just so special. I mean, she's just incredible student of the game. I mean, she just learns as she goes. Her stuff is just incredible. And she just felt like she wanted the ball today. And that's so cool to have a freshman that wants this moment. There's such big things in store for her future. And, and the LSU Tigers with her leaving us. Yeah, and holding Louisiana right now, great lineup to just one hit. Coach, thanks so much. Oh, Appreciate there's a the lot time. more to go. There's a lot more to go. <laughs> yes, there thank is. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Absolutely. That's why we always put the caveat in so far so as we far. go to the bottom of the fourth. But LSU fans breathing a bit more of a sigh of relief with this four-zip lead over, fair to say, their biggest rival in the state. And uh, this is a game where you really want it. I mean, you know going in. And in case you don't know, LSU not too thrilled with the fact that they call themselves Louisiana now. Down here in Baton Rouge, they call them UL Lafayette. There's, there's no love lost. And, oh, and this yeah. is a game, I mean, you know, Francesca, those rivalry games against Florida State, you know, and you were playing for the Gators. There's more on the line. There's definitely more on the line. I even like how Tarina said there's still a lot more game to go. Like, we cannot be thinking that we're going to win, especially if you look back to the regular season within those two matchups. The teams that scored first were actually the teams that came out on the losing side. So they're obviously not going to be keeping that in the back of their mind, but they're just going to try to continue to pour on those runs. LSU looks to add here with Carly Petty. It's the bottom of the order due. Petty, Gutierrez, and Stewart. They'll face Chloe Riazetto out for her first full inning of work. 
She came in, struck out Georgia Clark in relief of Sam Landry back in the third, but then gave up that two-run single we talked about with Allie Newland. Got Rudity to fly out to center, but the damage had already been done. One thing, though, you would say about Louisiana, they're still, even if they do lose this game to LSU, they're the favorites to get to the regional final for sure. I mean, they are the two seed, so Omaha and Prairie View A&M will play after this, and the winner will take on whoever falls in this 1-0 game. But they're playing for a 15th consecutive trip to championship Sunday. They don't just expect to get to a regional, and they're happy to be there. They're looking for a Supers, and they're looking for a Women's College World Series berth. Let's just say this score sticks. I would be scared to face the Raging Cajuns because they're going to come in with a chip on their shoulder for sure. Frustrated that they got themselves in the loser's bracket. And this is a highly successful program. They do not lose very often. No, they don't. As Carly Petty looks at strike three, we're seeing what Rhea Seto is made of here. Well, you just love this lefty-lefty matchup because the spin just looks like so different than you've ever seen before. It looks like it's going to cut in and then comes back over the middle of the plate and just stuns Petty. Here's Gutierrez with one out and nobody on. Another SEC team in action, having a little bit of trouble. Alabama and Middle Tennessee right now. Alabama has taken a 6-5 lead, but the Raiders are not going away here in the top half of the fourth inning down at uh, Rhodes House. Especially when you think that they don't have Montana Fouts right now. That's a huge game changer there. Central Arkansas also part of that. The, the Sugar Bears have uh, been one of the biggest stories, I think, uh, you know, in terms of a really high RPI. You no know, one really expected that kind of team to make the waves that they have. But I think everybody in the softball world now knows what UCA is made of. And, and they looked at that regional and thought, hey, this might be a challenge for Alabama if indeed Fouts is not able to pitch. Yeah, I mean, they made that upset against Arkansas early on in the season. And I really feel like that kind of etched in the stone of what this 2023 season is about. We say parody so often, but this is truly one of those years where it's anyone's ball game, who's going to show up outside of Oklahoma, and I would say UCLA. Those were always the two sure to win, but then yesterday UCLA dropped their opener in regional play. Anyone can win, Alex. I still don't think I'm over that result. Popped up out towards left. And Ushte, who just came in to play left field. Kramer Ushte squeezes it for out number two. I mean, you talk about monumental upsets in the history of this number tournament. Number I would say that is right up there with the number two overall seed, UCLA, with, you know, Maya Brady, National Player of the Year finalist, and Megan Faremo. I mean, beating Megan Faremo. Absolutely incredible. Not many Pac-12 teams can say that, let alone Grand Canyon, who won their first ever NCAA tournament game. Ball and no strikes on Savannah Stewart with two outs and nobody on. Riazetto has really come in and quieted the LSU bats so far. Kind of hit the reset button for Louisiana. That's really what her job was, to try to come in and take away that momentum from LSU. I mean, when you look towards that third inning, it just felt like every single pitch that they were getting, LSU was squaring up. You don't want a team to continue to roll into that confidence and just continue to pour runs off on if you're Louisiana. So you want to try to quiet the bats, get them overthinking. 
And that's why I like the move of bringing in the lefty, because it's such a different spin than what they're used to seeing. Flown out towards left, chases Ushte back a few steps, and she hauls it in. First one, two, three oh, inning for Louisiana in the field is LSU. Only one walk, one hit, four innings pitch. It's pretty good. Sure is, and this is a Louisiana team that is hitting 310 coming into the game, averaging almost six runs per contest. And Berzon is absolutely holding them at bay. Six, seven, and eight coming up for the Ragin' Cajuns as Alexa Langliers looks at a strike. I mean, you heard Coach Glasgow say they need to stop swinging at that drop ball. They need a forcer to bring it up. And those were some of the swings we just looked at that he's talking about. Can't be baiting on that pitch that's below our kneecap. Seven in a row retired for Burzon, originally from Buffalo, but moved to Tennessee and actually played her high school ball in Chattanooga, where she was the Tennessee Gatorade Player of the Year. Langliers to fly out to center. Her first time facing Burzon today. One two is driven into left, down for a base hit. And so for the second time today, the leadoff is on for Louisiana. And you're finally seeing that adjustment right there from Louisiana. Getting that pitch elevated in that zone to get that single. Now that is third baseman number three, Manny Hayes. And so we'll see if the bottom of the lineup can come through. That is the first hit of this tournament. Rather, yeah, the tournament for uh, the six through nine hitters. They went a combined 0 for 7 in yesterday's win. 5 nothing shutout of Omaha, the Summit League champions. It's going to be the Mavericks facing the Lady Panthers of Prairie View A&M when we are finished here. And Unfortunately, the worst part of every regional weekend when you have to say goodbye to teams. That's why that game is going to be high energy because a lot of emotions will be coming through those two teams. They don't want their season to be over. They're going to keep fighting. That's just such another element. I mean, we talk so much about how hot it is outside, just wearing when you're throwing a lot of pitches, but every single pitch, every at-bat, there's a lot of emotions that these young players put on themselves it becomes very draining. It's like you're after the game, your adrenaline just kind of goes away and you just think to yourself, oh, that was, that was intense. You know, it has to be so hard to play in game four of the weekend, the middle game, that first elimination game, because you put everything on the line and let's say you win that game. Well, then you have to face a team that won on Friday again when they're a little bit fresher. Got her on the inside corner. Second strikeout of the game for Burzon as Hayden is down looking. And I think Hayden thought that this was going to be a rise ball out of the zone because it started about her waist level. And usually when Burzon does go at that waist level, it is going to be that rise ball. But instead, she goes with her curveball. And that is what makes Burzon so incredibly tough to hit. She has ace pitches on six different ones. Louisiana makes a change, and now they turn to Jordan Campbell. The junior transfer from Texas A&M was the Sun Belt Newcomer of the Year last season. And she hit 392, 11 homers, 35 runs driven in. We saw Campbell yesterday's a pinch hitter in the fifth inning as well. She bounced out to third. Liking her approach right off of the bench. She's not baiting at that drop ball. She is sticking to what her coach asked her to do. Elevate that drop. Don't swing and miss at it. So much easier said than done because it just looks so good out of the hip. Tell me about the approach 
trying to leave that drop ball down. You kind of have two different approaches. If you're going to swing at it, you have to get up in the batter's box so you can try to get your barrel underneath it. You have to use your legs to create that type of leverage. I don't want to sound too dorky, but create a vertical barrel angle, kind of that steepness, so yeah. you're using that spin against it. You kind of get it a little bit before the drop, too, Exactly. Right? That's why you'd want to go up in the batter's box. Right. If you're for sure going to swing at it, if you want to take it, go in the back of the batter's box, but you have to be disciplined in that attack to know you cannot swing at that pitch that's going to come at your kneecap because you're taking it as a ball. Two and two on Campbell. We will do it again. But can't the pitcher read that too, based on where your feet are in the batter's box? Or are they just doing what they want to do? Well, I've been told pitchers hate when they see batters move in the batter's box. So if they start in the middle and then the next step bat they go up, it sometimes can throw them off. Sometimes can make them a little angry and they will just attack you. But it does, it changes up um, their process, gets them uncomfortable, but you have to do what you have to do to make that adjustment. Set yourself up for success. 2-2 two, two, right down Broadway. Back-to-back -back strikeouts looking against Louisiana for Burzon. Burzon just continues to be so good with this pitch. She noticed that Campbell was not baiting on that lower part of that drop, so she brings it up half of an inch for a called strike. That's a freshman out there making senior-level moves. Well, these are those little adjustments that even as a young player, it shows you why Beth Torina is so excited about her future. I even like when we talk to senior pitcher Ali Kilponen and the relationship that her and the freshman Burzon have. And Burzon say, man, I wish I could get my curveball to move like yours. And Kilponen was like, I wish I had your stuff when I was your age. <laughs> it has been really fun to see them learn from each other for sure. Sydney was even going through her workout earlier watching Allie. There she is in the bullpen, uh, throwing her bullpen, just getting ready for the weekend. And Sydney said, I'm glad the world worked out as it did that I get to play with you. It, it just shows you, it, I mean, it, it goes beyond softball. It's not just a connection in terms of, you know, improving her ability in the circle. It's about everything. And I also love how selfless that type of a comment is from both sides. I mean, they're just there to support one each other, not trying to let egos get in the way, but it's all about Tiger softball. Petty's got it for out number three. Skyed up there. She's had a terrific game defensively in second base. They don't want to be the first one on that bus. Top of the order due up for LSU. Four runs, six hits, an error for the Tigers, for the Ragin' Cajuns. Nothing in the run column, two hits, and no errors defensively. Danica Coffey, how do you keep her off the base paths? That's been the biggest question mark for Prairie View yesterday, and certainly Louisiana and head coach Jerry Glasgow today. She has been up four times in this regional, and she has reached every one, scored four runs with that stolen base. And she's been doing it with the power slap today, too. She's been really hammering that ball through the infield. Coffee's now reached base in 12 straight games. You can see where the defense is playing her right now. A little bit more crouched in. You have the corners, Valdez and Alred, expecting to see a bunt, though. Instead, it slapped right at the new third baseman, Valdez, in and out of her glove into center. And Danica Coffey has her third hit. I think I'm a little surprised to have seen the quarters be so far in, knowing that Coffey has been showing more of a power slap. And if Valdez is maybe one step behind or a little bit closer to that third base bag, would have been an easier play for her to make. Obviously, you want to get yourself in a, in a kind of a middle between situation when you have a slapper that can do multiple things with her barrel a soft slap or a hard slap, just like someone like Sierra Briggs can do. Instead, she tries the bunt. Great sacrifice. Excellently done. 3-4 there as Coffey moves into scoring position. Not an easy pitch to bunt either. It was way up and in.
Taylor Pleasant singled and scored her last time up. Also a bounce out back to the pitcher to begin her afternoon. This is kind of the rubber match of this season series. They've played twice already. They split the two meetings. A win for each team away from their home ballpark on back-to-back -back days, February 25th and 26th. Pleasance tries to bunt. Wow. And it's foul in the box. Hit her bat in the box. Took me by surprise. Yeah, I mean, she's coming from that lefty side, so maybe she's not seeing the spin as well out of the hand of Riazzetto. So you're going to see the replay of the ball hitting her in the batter's box. And it looks like they're going to challenge this because I think that Louisiana feels that the ball hit Pleasance out of the box. They are going to use their second challenge. Tried once already today, unsuccessful. I don't know if you noticed the weird look I gave you just now because I actually thought the same thing from, from my view, which is not the best view for this type of a play. It did look like it could have hit her out of the batter's box. Let's take a look here. So she gets it down, she goes. Uh, I mean, you can't really tell where her front foot is, but she, I mean, she didn't really take a step. She yeah. could very well be in the batter's box. I think you're there right. There we go, let's take a look right here. I think maybe it bounces right back up and hits the barrel while she's still, or it's the handle while she's still in the box, right here. So it depends where it hits her. If it hit her first, when it bounces up immediately, it's a foul ball. Yeah. But if it doesn't make contact with her and it waits a little bit longer till it's more on falling towards the ground, it I looked just, like her foot was out of the box. And I just don't think there's enough there to right. make it indisputable. Right. We need indisputable video evidence to overturn this call. The play at home earlier today, the umpires were right on. And it is a foul ball. Home plate umpire, Robbie Guest says it's a foul ball and the call once again is upheld it's so great that we have these video replays because you know as a coach as a team you don't have any of those what ifs right you know that the call was completely correct there's nothing that could have happened elsewise also let's give the crew some credit in this game they've been right on top of both of those really difficult bang bang plays i agree all right, so 0-2 now, the count on Pleasance. Coffey is still on second base, representing that potential fifth run, trying to open this game up even more. They have held Louisiana scoreless with just two hits to speak of. Both singles. Great job by the catcher. Peace goes back there trying to keep that in front of her, or keeping it in front of her, because you know if it gets away just like one inch, Coffee's going to take off to third. This is something Louisiana never sees. They have never been held scoreless this season this late into a ball game. Wow, that's, I mean, that makes sense because of just how crazy their offense is. All the power they have, they're usually able just to rely on that one big swing, that home run swing. And now three and two. I feel like that just shows how good the freshman Burzon is pitching right now. This might make Betarina's decision if they can get past Louisiana tomorrow, even diff more difficult. Taylor Pleasant sends it towards right, but just got it off at the end of the bat. Ushte fires in, but Coffee advances to third. Let's reset the defense because Jerry Glasgow has put on his mad scientist cap and has completely changed this up. So now it's Hayden defense and Ushte, who you just saw reel in that ball in right field. Up the middle, Langoliers and Kotzelnik. That's the same, but Valdez switches from behind the plate to third. Allred still at first, and Sophie Piscos comes behind the plate to catch for Valdez. 
Did you get that? Remember, Hayden was the starting third baseman, and now she is out in left field. Ushte wasn't even in the starting lineup, and now she's in right field. I'm impressed you're keeping up with it very well, Alex. I am keeping up with it with a strong hat tip to our statistician, Kevin Maloney, <laughs> who just drew out the entire infield and outfield for me. Oh, you needed the visual. Oh, yeah. 1 0 Sky behind the plate. Get out of play. LSU's offense has really been rolling. I mean, now they've scored 16 runs in these two games against Prairie View and Louisiana. But this is a bat they could really use, especially tomorrow. Yeah, I was just thinking that Georgia Clark has been pretty silent in the first two games at this regional. And she comes into this regional and still does, leading this team in home run power. She has 12 on the season. The next best is with Taylor Pleasance with eight. So you're going to always want to have that big swing. But she's that prototypical power type of a swing. So if it's going to go, it's going to go far. She's not someone that I'm going to say that has a t uh, that's usually going to have that high batting average. But as a power hitter above 300, that's usually your goal. And the one two is skied out towards left. In to get it, Hayden. And there is the final out of the fifth. Let's go to the sixth inning with LSU protecting a 4 nothing lead. Plays. They might look like they're easy, but in that one particularly, it has a lot of hops, knowing that you have to get rid of it soon. Petty's my like defender MVP of the day. Or of this game, because we have a we have a long day. Yes, we do. And and we very well, if this result holds, we will be seeing Louisiana one more time this evening. I am with you, though. I mean, she's made two great plays to retire Davis. She threw out Carly Heath at home, saving a run and kind of changing the game in a lot of ways because that was back at the top of the second. LSU scored four unanswered since then. And really, those those three crucial ground balls that came to her, they came in so hard, and she had to use her glove like she had it up near her, her core and then quickly bounce and had to readjust low. Like, those could have been errors very easily. Kotzelnik trying to bunch her way on. Berzan up firing, not in time. Just the third hit of the game against Berzan. And now one on and one away in the sixth for Louisiana. Well, I like the move to go for the butt here. You're struggling to try to get a hard swing, a hard hit, so why not shorten it up? And she executes this exactly where you want it to go, right to the pitcher. Yep, they need base runners right here. And now down to just five outs remaining against the Tigers. Hoping to not fall into the loser's bracket in the second elimination game of the day. We got the big bats coming up here, starting with Sophie Piscos taking a strike inside corner. Singled into the gap in right center in the first, also a pop out to second. The winner certainly has the cushier road to the Super Regionals. Oh, and two. That is, that is such a tough pitch. Burzon normally throws around 65 miles per hour. She can go in with an off speed at 57. That pitch came in at 60 miles per hour. So she just takes four miles per hour off of it and produces that swing and miss. I mean, that's incredible. Bouncer in the hole left side and through. Louisiana's cooking here in the sixth. And this is the third time that they have seen Burzon, and we are seeing those adjustments finally come through for the Raging Cajuns. You can just see that back side right there from Piscos. 
being able to get that vertical bat angle like I talked to you about, Alex. Get that drop ball hard through that 5-6 hole. First time that Louisiana has had consecutive base runners on all game. They've been limited to just four singles and a walk. And Lauren Allred fights one off foul down the left side. I mean, the offense this entire 2023 season for college softball has been crazy. You've seen adjustments happen so quickly because of access to video, being able to study. So it is extremely hard for a pitcher to get through a lineup twice, let alone three times, especially a potent one like Louisiana. Sent out towards left center, and it takes a bounce off of the wall. Briggs gets it in quickly, and Louisiana is now in a pickle between second and third. They're going to try to get the runner in, Holman Konselnik. Throw behind her, not in time, and they'll go back to second. How are we going to score this one? Gutierrez back to third. Coffey applies the tag to the lead runner. A disaster on the base pass for the Raging Cajuns. I don't think I've ever seen, Alex, a double pickle situation happen. This ball is crushed from the freshman all red. Almost looked like this was going to be a home run. But take a look at Briggs being able to quickly get it off the wall and get it all the way into Pleasance. And she sees they are doubled up at third base. She runs her all the way back, tries to get them out at home. And here's where he tried to think two man, she's safe at third and then here comes that double pickle again coffee finally able to cut it down and secure the out all i can say is best of luck to the official score <laughs> that had some sandlot situation happening right there little benny the jet even though he usually came out winning he usually yeah. yeah he yeah. usually gets home that's the problem all right talk to me we can talk about the pickle all day and uh you know the real issue at hand here is that louisiana base running i mean to beat a team like lsu you're finally getting to burzon three straight hits that's tough i i just think that you that they thought that ball was going to bounce off a little bit shorter and that briggs was not going to be able to throw it in as quickly as she did so here's really the biggest, I guess, feather in LSU's cap defensively, and we've seen it twice now, is Briggs out in center field. Squibber foul left side. I mean, on that single by Piscos in the first inning, she cuts the ball off, holding her. So she has to stay put at first base, eventually gets stranded at second. And right there, Jerry Glasgow, because Briggs gets it in and plays it so well off the wall, he has to hold Kotzelnik at third. And then, you know, very clearly, Piscos couldn't really see what was going on there. So many times, especially as young athletes, you think outfield is boring, but it is not. <laughs> they are so crucial when it comes to a success in a ball game like this. As you get older, you are the last line of defense out there. Ripped down the left field line by Heath. That's going to go foul. All right, I have the official scoring for that play. Are you ready for it? Let's hear it. All right, get your calculator out because it seems like you're, you know, entering something in a math problem. It's an 8-6-4-2-5-6-3-5. So if you're scoring along with us at home, once again, 8-6-4-2-5-6-3-5. And you might be able to order a pizza doing that too. I'm going to put that down in your book. That would sound pretty good, actually, right now. 0-2 oh, on Heath. Strike three called on the inside corner. Everything is coming up purple and gold at Tiger Park in the 1-0 game. Can also throw it as well. The South Carolina transfer is going to go into the circle here. Yeah, she can do it all. Someone that utilizes a screwball, has a drop ball, also can clip it on the outside with that curveball. But... She tends to have that upspin that goes right down the middle of the plate. So her key is that she needs to keep that ball low in the zone. She'll face Newland, Rudity, and Petty. 
in the sixth inning. Newland and Rudity responsible for three of the four LSU runs. Two runs single from Newland, last at bat, and then the solo shot from Rudity in the first inning. Or second, check that. This is the first time that Carly Heath has seen the rubber since against Louisiana Monroe back on May 5th through four and two thirds. Shutout ball given just up one hit with three strikeouts. And so Louisiana down to its final three outs coming up and now have Langoliers, Hayden and Either Valdez or Campbell are the ones that are due. Campbell pinch hit for Valdez last time up. Tensions running high, you would imagine, for Louisiana. They know exactly what is at stake. They got to wait around and see who comes out of the first elimination game to see who they'll play later tonight. I always wondered that, Francesca. Like, are you are you going back to the hotel? Are you sticking around, just getting some food, chilling out, maybe playing some games? Considering how hot it is, I think the best bet would probably be just to get into AC, whether that is on the bus in the AC, maybe just be able to go back to the hotel and stretch it out, get some treatment. And my, my very first year at the Women's College World Series, I actually lost the opening game to Louisiana and put myself in the loser's bracket and we had to try to fight out of there and it was hard. Newland plunked. And we would go back to the hotel after, well, thankfully we won every game after that except for the very last one, but uh, we'd go back to the hotel after each one and just try to stretch out and relax because like I mentioned earlier, so much emotion goes into those elimination games knowing that if you lose, your season is done. And you don't want that to happen. So you are in it every single pitch. So you need that moment to kind of just bring yourself down and reset. I guess my biggest question is, is would there even be enough time? Say that this game ends somewhere between, you know, 220, 230, then you got to go through your post game stuff, maybe get back to the hotel with, I don't know, an hour to spare before, if that, because you got to be back here a couple hours before your next game. Although, who knows what time, I mean, it's slated for six Eastern, five local. Who knows what time that, that final game of the day actually ends up? It depends, of course, on what happens in the first elimination game, how long this game goes. It's all kind of TBD at this yeah. point. And I think at the end of the day, as a coach, you have to protect your players and get them the rest that they need, even if it's just 45 minutes. But you don't want you don't want to be coming Ball into two a game. strikes now on Rudy. Sorry, I was just going to say you don't want to come into a game feeling fatigued. Like you need to feel as rest up as possible. Big cut and a miss on one and two, and Rudity is the first strikeout victim of Carly Heath. Just a couple of weeks away, we'll send 16 teams to the Super Regionals. Eight sites. If it's LSU, it will depend on whatever comes out of the Seattle Regional because Washington is the host and the number seven seed, and so if LSU or Louisiana advance, and uh, so does Washington, or any team for that matter in Baton Rouge, then it would be in Seattle. If there's an upset there, who knows? Maybe right back here at Tiger Park. It's a possibility. Yeah, and if both those regional, let's say both those regional uh, hosts we, win, it'd be another purple, purple clash there. Yes, it would be. Yeah. And it is not crazy for a couple of regional two seeds to both advance we saw with Mississippi State and, and Arizona last year. And they got to host in Starkville for the first time. Yeah, that was pretty much the definition of mayhem last year. Yeah. Arizona coming out of the regional, then coming out and 
winning the Super Regional to make it to the Women's College World Series where they barely even got it into the postseason last year. And then the upset for Mississippi State against FSU. That's crazy. I wonder what's going to happen at the end of this weekend, Alex. Who knows? I mean, that's why, that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Oh, what is in there now? Nothing in two on Raylene Gutierrez. Right now, it is all chalk so far here in Baton Rouge, but that can change in an instant. Newland goes, throw, not there in time. And she's able to stay on the bag as she tumbles down. Love seeing the two girls right there smiling, saying, I didn't mean to, my bad, just a mistake. I see Newland take off and Pisco has kind of held that frame, even though she comes at strong throw, but she was trying to hold the frame. Newland gets under the tag and as she was falling back because of that momentum, and it'll skirt away from Piscos. Newland to third. And that's just bad luck right there from Piscos. Thinking that she does not have to turn her glove over, just trying to catch it straight up with that glove. I mean, this is the third pitcher for Louisiana. Piscos has been starting in the in, behind the plate. It's hard to try to read all the different spins when you have to catch different pitchers in a game. Two and two now on Gutierrez. Flared out towards short. And Langoliers gloves it for out number three here in the sixth. Brazan trying to close out her 10th complete game of her freshman season. Has not allowed a run, just scattered five we hits to the Raging Cajuns. The Sun Belt regular season and conference tournament champions. Langoliers, Hayden, and Possibly Valdez, possibly Campbell do. And that is just a little bit low and inside to start things off. Langelier singled her last time up. I think in some ways, though, Louisiana is going to look back at this game if they can't overtake this four run advantage for LSU and, and think what could have been getting thrown out at home by Petty, the second baseman. Heath was cut down, and that really altered the game, certainly in LSU's favor back in the second. They've scored those four unanswered runs since. And then, of course, the double pickle a couple innings ago. I agree with you, just running themselves out of scoring opportunities. But I still think they're going to go back to they need to make quicker adjustments early on in the game to give themselves more than just one or two scoring opportunities. 2-1 high fly ball, right field, chases Rudini back, and she makes the catch over her shoulder for out number one. One of those four members of the SEC all-defensive team. Maddie Hayden now 0 for 2. Fielder's choice and a strikeout looking against Burzon. Not necessarily known as much of a strikeout pitcher. She's got four of them so far today. Really uses that excellent defense to her advantage. I mean, typically when you are that drop ball pitcher, that's what you need to do. You don't want to try to be someone that you're not, because if you do, then your stuff isn't moving the right way. It's always a mindset you hear drop ball pitchers say, like, I got to trust my defense behind me and just hit my spots. This is skied out towards center field. No issues for Briggs as she plays the high sky and reels it in. Louisiana down to its final out. I just think another frustrating level for Louisiana is you're starting to see some of those adjustments being made against Burzon, but they're getting two underneath the ball because of the adjustments from Burzon. She's lifting that right, or excuse me, that drop ball just a little bit more and just kind of playing little cat and mouse here. I love it. Strategy all the way through. She certainly thinks the game, according to Beth Torina, and we can see those adjustments being made inning after inning by the freshman Burzon. 0-1 oh on Victoria Valdez. In her one at bat, she grounded out to short. 
Like, how good do you get to be when you're like, okay, we're grooving with your drop ball, so why don't we just start throwing your off speed? Or, you know what, let's try to float that 60 mile per hour rise ball up there. Let's just see what happens. Like, that's the kind of good stuff you want as a pitcher. That's when everything's working for you. No balls and two strikes on Valdez. To coffee, across the diamond. LSU moves on to the regional final and we will see the Tigers on championship Sunday. I think when you saw this regional matchup, you knew Louisiana was upset. You knew LSU was upset because...